The Buckeye State stands its ground with the likes of Texas, Florida, Georgia, and California when it comes to the competition level of high school football. Ohio boasts the fifth most NFL players in the country. Over 80 roster spots are filled by players from the Buckeye State. The third smallest city in Ohio claims 19 state tournament appearances and entering 2020, seven Final Four trips. It took the school's greatest football player two decades later to take the program to unprecedented new heights. This is the Mitch Hewitt story. This is his legacy. State champs, legends, Mitch Hewitt is brought to you by the Gene Seminaro Agency. As an all-state agent in Chardon, Gene knows many local families and provides customers with an outstanding level of service, helping families like yours protect the things that are important, your family, home, car, boat, and more. And by Howard Hanna. Discover Howard Hanna Real Estate Services, providing a complete experience, one-stop shopping in real estate, mortgage, title, and insurance services. Karen Barnes, Beverly Johnson, and James Barnes are proud to sponsor the State Champ story of Mitch Hewitt. So my mom and dad both graduated from Chardon. My grandma was an elementary school teacher right over there across the street. My grandpa drove a bus for Chardon. Chardon, Ohio, a smaller city with just over 5,000 residents and a football program built from scratch over the last 40 years. Mitch Hewitt, a homegrown Chardon kid, enrolled in the high school in 1995, just one year after the Hilltoppers won their first Division II state title under Coach Bob Doyle. You know, Coach Doyle, who was my mentor here, uh, I always joke that we're like the Pittsburgh Steelers of, of high school football because we've had three head coaches in 40-some years, which is rare as coaches come and go nowadays. And uh, I'd have to say that the success that the program had and Coach Doyle were probably huge parts of me wanting to be a football player. Here. Hewitt grew up playing multiple sports, heavily influenced by his mom Elizabeth and his coaches. Over in those apartment complexes, I had a single mom who essentially raised me, and my mom just lives uh, right across the street right now, currently. He was very close with his grandparents, who just live a couple streets over from here, and who helped raise him when his mom was working. Um, she's always worked, and um, he had a a really good relationship, strong relationship with them. And his grandpa, if he was alive right now, would just be like over the moon. My, my dad was around and, and my grandparents were a huge part, but my mom, uh, again, like, she, like any single parent out there, like, like parenting's hard and, and I have a great wife who does 98% of it. I can't imagine what it's like to be a single parent trying to raise adolescents uh, and navigate him through all the pitfalls of, of, of that. But uh, she did a great job. So I had a stepdad and he was, uh, at the time, very authoritarian with like tasks and getting up at 6 a.m. and not setting alarms and, and doing his chores the way he wanted them done. So the school and athletics were always like, like sort of a father figure for me. Hewitt made the freshman squad. Then the next year, he got the call up. His first career start on varsity, Hewitt broke his foot. He kept playing throughout the season, but it wasn't until his upperclassman years that football took off. So junior uh, year emerges and I become player of the year defensively and then offensively my senior year, that sort of took off. So I, I was a two-way player, runner up Mr. Football my senior year, and we lost in a state title game on a hook and ladder uh, with waning seconds to go. I still haven't watched the game myself. Still, 22 years later, Coach Bob Doyle dubbed Mitch Hewitt the greatest player in Chardon history, and his girlfriend at the time, Gail, was there to witness it. She was a uh, freshman in college when I was a senior in high school, so she made it back for every game my senior year, which is 14, and, and, and that's a huge commitment too. Again, you're, you're a freshman in college, right? That's not exactly the, the ideal scene to be driving back to watch your high school boyfriend play sports. Not long after, the football journey would lead them from Northeast Ohio to Northwest Ohio. We, we finished up the state title game, and the following week I went to Bowling Green and uh, committed. From Chardon High School to 154 miles west in Bowling Green, Ohio, Mitch Hewitt would work his way into a starting job by year two. First up for the Falcons, the Wolverines in Ann Arbor. Michigan and Bowling Green, the Wolverines in great field position. It's the 2000 season opener. Starting lineup, DJ Durkin, the heart and soul of that front line. Chris Delavella anchors the linebacking core with Hewitt and Fisher. First and 18, and Navarre goes down, loses the football, still loose. 
So that is the end of the game. Michigan wins this one 42 to 7. Hewitt recorded six solo tackles against the Wolverines. However, two games later at Temple on September 16, 2000, Hewitt would tear his ACL out for the rest of the season. Bowling Green would finish 2-9 and nine overall. Anytime in athletics when you get injured, you all of a sudden, it's, and it's not by anyone's choosing, you just become sort of left behind. And psychologically, as much as physically, um, it, it, it's a hard recovery. We struggled. We weren't very good. It was, it was the end of the Gary Blackney era. And uh, I was considering transferring. And it was one of those deals that I would have rather gone to Mount Union, pay full tuition, than have my, my schooling paid for and lose. Because, uh, you know, losing is contagious. You know, Mitch was a guy who you, you knew when he walked in the door, he was a little bit different. And it's in a good way. He was a little bit different in a way where you knew he was going to be a very good player. Um, you knew that once he put on that college strength and conditioning, that he was going to be a guy that was going to be able to make plays. And, and not just because of his physical, but his mental acumen was also very, very, uh, very important. I remember when Urban showed up, he actually, I would have been the personal protector, you know, my whole life at BG. And, you know, when Urban showed up, Mitch became the personal protector. And, you know, you only put the smart, tough guys at that position because they have to be able to make the line calls for your punt team. And so when Urban showed up, I got replaced by Mitch and um, you know but you know it was one of those things like you know playing against him in practice you 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 earned, you earned a lot of respect for him immediately coming from a successful high school program the last thing I wanted to do was was be stuck in college losing week after week uh, but then with urban coming in and there was there was new life there was hope and I don't think anyone would let me quit you know my mom certainly wasn't gonna let me come home she wasn't gonna pick me up and then to make things even crazier that's when they brought in coach Meyer and uh, then things changed very rapidly, and everything went from like 10 miles an hour to about 100 miles per hour overnight. College football is so hard, especially the way we kind of go about it. I'd say 100% of all the players at some point said, why am I doing this? This is really hard. Uh, especially when they, you know, Bowling Green had really lack of success for a long time. So I could see that. And, but I'm glad he did it, obviously, because we needed him. And then also, look at where he is now. Urban had us so keyed up when we were playing. Like, and it took a while to get used to it. We would go through the special teams meeting as a team. And Urban was the special teams coach. And if you got caught loafing, you got undressed in front of the whole team. There was one dude I really thought, I was like, he's gonna cry in the car. <laughs> he's gonna cry in the car. <laughs> you have a certain expectation level of each player of the program, and we were not gonna change that. So one of the two things happen when you do that, Players elevate themselves or they leave. And that's what a lot of people, a lot of people decided to leave. The intensity in which he did things at Bowling Green without the media coverage probably would have gotten him fired at Ohio State. And, and, and he would, he, he's admitted that before. And he says that with a smile. 20, 25 plus full scholarship players left the team. Wild times. In the 2001 season, the Falcons went 8-3, shocking the world with the season-opening win at Missouri and picking up other notable wins against Northwestern and their biggest rival, Toledo. Urban brought in some guys that contributed to our success, but for the most part, he took uh, the 2-9 and nine players and he changed them into championship caliber players. The Falcons, experiencing their best season since 1994 when they went 9-2, and two, now going into Urban Meyer's second season at the helm. Redshirt junior Mitch Hewitt slated to be the starting outside linebacker after registering 84 tackles, a sack, and an interception the previous season. You acquired a linebacker, Mitch Hewitt. What comes to mind? What words describe him to you? Uh, relentless. He was a guy that was had a vision for what kind of player he would be, and he would work at all costs to do that. And then, you know, including the weight room, including just the way he trained in the offseason and then obviously practice. He was, a, he was a grinder, relentless about everything he did. In the 2002 season, more wins, nine of them with just three losses. Mitch Hewitt adding to his career starts in defensive touchdowns, however, still no postseason bowl game. The offseason news, though, would send a shock through the Falcons' locker room. He leaves for Utah, and I remember that being an extremely hard day, too, because it was one of those deals I learned right away in the Mid-American Conference that coaches come and go, right? They're going to take the next highest paycheck. And as a 19, 20-year-old kid, you feel betrayed, but as an adult, you understand the finances of it a little bit better, and uh, I understand why he left. 
two seasons and a 17-6 overall record, Urban Meyer was on to the next. For Mitch Hewitt, he remained focused going into his last season at Bowling Green with some big moments to check off. So we got married, um, honeymooned in Bowling Green. And we were married at the end of May, spent two or three days up there, and Mitch went back to summer workouts. We purchased our first house, and Mitch signed the mortgage papers outside of the locker room. Uh, you know, while everyone else was doing college stuff, like I was again like the old man in the locker room, and uh, it, it was a different lifestyle. And that was one of the hardest things that I think I, I had to transition to, because it was everyone's like, hey, let's go out, let's go out, let's go out, let's go out. And one of the things that my father-in-law told me when I asked for his daughter's hand in marriage was that you have to guard your relationship. Marrying his high school sweetheart, check. Selected to be one of the four captains, check. Now, the Falcons would enter into the Greg Brandon era that included wins over ranked teams and ESPN College Game Day's first trip to a MAC school. Supremacy for now, anyway, and the MAC West Division at stake. And Bowling Green comes in with a 10 game home winning streak. And in that streak, the average scoring more than 50 points per game. This is a very fun offense. This game is going to be decided by two things. Number one, I think you're going to see a team that's hungry. Bowling Green lost this game last year. The snap to Pope, right up the middle. Pope into the end zone. Touchdown, Falcon. Third down. It is caught at the 48-yard line by P.J. Flack. It takes a big hit from Mitch Hewitt. He gets only three yards. So fourth down, they will go for it. The clock running at 4.34 left. How about Josh Harris? 27-43, 4.38, three touchdowns, two pass interceptions. And that is the final. 34-18 Falcons over the Huskies. All Bowling Green. Well, I mean, that year we lost to Ohio State by a touchdown, and, and we, we should have had it tied up. Uh, you know, we, we go and beat Purdue at Purdue. And twice, the Falcons and Red Hawks of Miami, Ohio would meet. Once in midweek MAC fashion, the other in the 2003 MAC championship game. Big Ben was a great player, but I don't think we knew until after the game. I remember standing there before an interview and they brought in the captains to do it. And I was like, I remember looking at my buddy and I go, we, I don't think we can beat him. Uh, like, like, like there was just something about, again, that team, the players they had, his leadership, his style. When you rushed him, he would dump it. And when you covered, he would run. And then sure enough, we played him for the MAC championship game a few weeks later at Bowling Green. And it was, it was the same sort of deal. Like it was like, I remember like making a new goal halfway through, like let's not let him score 50. Cause you gotta rewrite your goals sometimes in the moment. A lopsided loss in the MAC championship game, but another game on the horizon. The Motor City Bowl in Detroit, Bowling Green versus Northwestern. His bowl game his senior year was like the day after Christmas. So we didn't spend Christmas together or anything. We just, but after that game, he came home and did his student teaching here. So, and then we started living together. And I started picking up his clothes. <laughs> BG would get the 28 to 24 win and three head coaches, five position coaches, a senior captain, and rankings in the top 25 later. Mitch Hewitt's career as a Falcon and a football player was over. Oh, I wasn't good enough, you know what I mean? I'd be the first one to tell you that. Like, like, like I, I, had a, I had a great high school career. I was blessed to have a, a successful college career. But again, I, I was married, I had a mortgage, I had dogs. Uh, physically, like I'd been through enough. Like, and, and again, I, I just, like, like anyone who tells you that physically was the reason, or injuries was the reason I didn't move on, it, that's a lie, I, I wasn't good enough. Uh, I, I worked out for some teams, um, but I, I was ready to transition. You know what I mean? Like, like my life, I think from that point, went, to uh, like not playing to becoming more like a coach is what it, sort of I wanted to do anyhow. The transition time began. Hewitt working on becoming a high school teacher in his hometown while flipping houses, assistant coaching, and he and his wife Gail building an ice cream shop, King Cone, into a successful business. Hewitt was also eyeing the head coaching vacancy at his alma mater. One of the great strengths of our program is we've had three head coaches in 40 years. So Coach Doyle was here for a long time, and then his assistant, Coach DePofi, was here for probably nine or ten years. Hewitt knew exactly who to call to help vouch for him. My dad was the principal at Chardon when he hired Coach Hewitt, and I remember we were at like Disney World or something, and my dad, like I didn't know who Urban Meyer was at the time, but my dad got a call from Urban Meyer, and like, like I didn't really know who he was, but like looking back on it, like wow. 
you know, like it was a call from Urban Meyer to like recommend Coach Hewitt. What qualities does Mitch Hewitt possess that makes him a good coach that you would go and recommend him to start in high school? Well, Mitch Hewitt has the number one quality that, in my mind, that makes coaches successful and he cares deeply for those who play the game. And that's the health and, you know, it's never been more important, health and safety, especially with the COVID and, uh, you know, so many things going on, uh, not just with football, all sports. Uh, but it also means the health and well-being of players off the field. That's the academics. That's the fact that, you know, you got a chance to really impact someone. I have a few aces, and I, and I think I played them at the right time, and I, hopefully I get a few more if I, if I need them. But, uh, you know, he, he's been very, very good to me uh, in, 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 in an uncomfortable way. Like, 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 he demands discipline. He demands toughness. Um, I think anyone, if you ask us at the time when Urban was there originally, do we like Urban? I think we just said, heck no. I mean, he's... He's crazy, he's nuts, he's demanding, he's intense, he's in your face. Uh, but again, sort of like my stepfather, when you look back on it, these are the things that shape you for the challenges of what life is. Because life, as we tell these kids all the time, like life's not easy. Winning three conference championships in the Hewitt era since 2011 wasn't easy. Neither were the seven playoff appearances. In this fall, nothing would come close in difficulty to navigating high school sports in a pandemic. It was a terrifying fall in that regard, I, I can't lie, because every, you, you can do everything right and still have kids that test positive or, or kids who, who get sick. And, and it's, it just felt like there was so much that was out of our control and there was so much uncertainty. Chardon was able to stay healthy en route to an undefeated regular season. Then they knocked off opponents one by one in the playoffs. This was the scene coming home from a 47-7 win over Tiffin Columbian in the state semifinals. It was so neat to see essentially people coming together despite all the things that I think have divided our nation over the last six, seven months. And uh, it, it wasn't political, it wasn't your stance on, on COVID. Uh, it was a bunch of people from all walks of life supporting a team and that's the beauty of sports. I always tell people that I think there's that there, there's two things that, that cross all economic, social status, race, black, this, that, other, white, is, is weather and sports. And, and it, it unifies people. And uh, it's something that we all share, we all have in common. And uh, that's what we saw that night when we drove back through, is that people had put aside a, a rather rough year to come together to support a bunch of high school kids who really brought the, the community together. The community would need to come together for one last game. I think it's what uh, all of 2020 has been because there has to be like a, a level of faith that we were going to have a season. Uh, there has to be a level of hope that we're going to be able to continue with our season. And I think the love part of it is, is that you really had to love the game this year because again, there wasn't the student sections, there wasn't the pep rallies, there wasn't the homecomings, uh, there wasn't any of the other frills that come along with the season, especially one of, of, of our caliber. And so I think we saw that with our players. I mean, there, was a, there was high levels of faith, hope, and then the love was, was unbelievable. It's agape, like it's unconditional. Paul Brown Tiger Stadium here in Massillon is where we are, Greg. There's not a better place to be than right here to do this game. What a wonderful place to have a state championship. I've seen many a game here, many great games. Welcome to the OHSAA Division III State Championship game, where the Chardon Hilltoppers will take on the Scallions of St. Francis de Sales. Chardon, a team that has had no problem winning games all season. They have been dominant all year, really dominant all the way through the regular season and the playoffs. As I mentioned, they play sound defense. They really rush the football well. They don't throw it a lot. They can be efficient when they throw it, and they're sound on special teams. Traditionally, for a program like us who doesn't throw the ball, like, like being down two scores with six minutes to go is really a, usually an insurmountable lead for us. Uh, but I remember even like Drew Fetcher coming over to me and looking me in the eyes, dead serious, and saying, we got this coach. The, the wheel route passed to Blake Bark, which cut the deficit from 14 to 7. And once that happened, uh, and that was a one-play drive. So we got the ball back, that, that Drew, Drew connected with, with Blake, and, and all of a sudden, the momentum shifted and there was hope again. Faith, hope, and love, there was hope again. You look up at the clock and you're thinking, all right, now I think we have enough time. It looked bleak when we, we, we had a, 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 a trick play called a hook and lateral. Fourth and goal from about the 12 yard line and um, we called timeout. Coach Hewitt said, what about hook and lateral? And I said, let's do it. 
which was called back. And if you've been around Chardon football for a while, the 1998 state championship team lost the game on an opponent's hook and lateral play. And the ruling was that our receiver's knee was down when he caught the ball before he flipped it to the, the, his teammate that scored. Ironically, I've watched the 2020 game a lot uh, since that happened, but I have not gone back and watched the 1998 game. It's about three minutes to play here in the fourth quarter. 28-21, Chart trying to come back and tie it. And he should be there for the touchdown. And the extra point is good. 28-28, 2.13 remaining here in the fourth quarter. Shard was down by 14. They looked like they were left for dead. The only ones who thought that wasn't the case, them. And they have come back with resurgence here to tie this game. You know, you've got parents in the crowd, they're all watching their kid. I watch Mitch, you know? And I've never seen him so calm. I never. I'm like, why is he so calm? Why is he not freaking out? Because I'm freaking out. And um, he just, and I have a video which I had posted on Facebook of him at the end on the final kick walking in the opposite direction. But, you know, he had his arms out praying and he just falls to his knees when it's over. And I just, like, in that moment, it's like, ah, you know, it's done, and he did it. And I'm so happy for him. But the work is never done. After the perfect 12-0 season, a new standard had been set by Hewitt for the Hilltoppers. You're not a believer in what this team's capable of. You better become one real quick. We got something here, guys. Despite returning just five starters, Chardon once again plowed through the regular season, led by a defense relentless like their head coach, giving up just seven points per game with five shutouts. Defense wins championships, and I think going into the year, we didn't totally know what we had because we had to replace so many people. Uh, but I'm a believer, and I think uh, a lot of people tonight are as well. And that belief carried on through the playoffs into the Division Three title game, where the Hilltoppers became keen of the hill once again. Chardon knocked off Hamilton Baden 21-14 to to win its second straight state championship and become the first team in Ohio high school history to finish with a 16-0 record. The message afterward, the same as a year ago. A message he would want his Hilltoppers to take with them wherever they go. We've talked about faith, hope, and love as being the foundations of your life, right? But like, like this is a huge moment in your life. You'll have it for the rest of your life, but it won't define you. Right? And things will come and go, right? And I would say the same speech had we lost or won, man. But I am so proud of you. Our faith in this team, right? The hope, right, of what was going I've, I've never been more calm in an entire football game in my life. 
I've never been more calm. Oh, I do. <laughs> Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of them all, right, is love. And there's love in this huddle, man. There's love right here. It's a brotherhood. You awake in the graveyard, right? All week long, you have friends, gone friends I haven't talked to in 10 years, to talk about Hilltop, to talk about Chardon. You got a community, and you can take this back home. Yeah. 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 Wow. State champs, legends, Mitch Hewitt is brought to you by the Gene Seminaro Agency. As an all-state agent in Chardon, Gene knows many local families and provides customers with an outstanding level of service, helping families like yours protect the things that are important, your family, home, car, boat, and more. And by Howard Hanna. Discover Howard Hanna Real Estate Services, providing a complete experience. One-stop shopping in real estate, mortgage, title, and insurance services. Karen Barnes, Beverly Johnson, and James Barnes are proud to sponsor the State Champ story of Mitch Hewitt.